I was on a radio program with the Astronomer Royal in this country, and, and I said, frankly, yeah. the expanding universe stinks. It's <laughs> not expanding, it's changing its shape. Julian, it's great to see you. I checked, it's been almost a decade, which gives me some sense that maybe uh, time is some kind of an illusion. Uh, and, and having been sheltered for months where Wednesday seems the same as Sunday, time no longer seems to be flowing in my life. So I'm almost becoming a believer in your radical theory of time. Um, I, I, in, in all seriousness though, I, I have uh, read the, the, your new book, The Janus Point, The New Theory of Time. And uh, I was immediately struck by the, um, the vastness of, of your vision. The last time we spoke, we were focused on time, which was radical enough in terms of your approach. But now from that, you've built a, a, a really a remarkable superstructure that <laughs> engages virtually everything. So what I'd like to do to begin is give you my sense of the major ideas that you have, um, and then you go through it, correct me, get, we want to get the overview, and then we want to go into each of the pieces to give the uh, justification, or at least the reasons for the speculation. So let me start, and I have roughly five points. Uh, first, that time does not flow, and it does not have a single direction past the future. Second, the history of the classical universe is a succession of shapes it's an important word in your work, shapes, from which the notion of duration of what we may think is time emerges. Three, the history of the universe is not one of increasing disorder, which of course is the traditional and, and conventional wisdom in science increasing uh, entropy, but rather, you say, of the growth of structure. So we're going to need to talk about structure. Four, you have a what you call a new vision of the Big Bang, which is you define as the Janus point, because time then flows in both directions, the Janus being two faces, it fl flows in two directions from the Janus point, and it's driven by, you say, the expansion of the universe and the growth of order, whether it's galaxies, planets, or, or life. And then the fifth and final point is that you challenge the conventional wisdom that the universe and all reality is headed for heat death, which is not dying by heat, it's the, it's the death of heat, so that there's a, a very bleak future where nothing can happen because everything is, is totally homogeneous. And, uh, and as a result of challenging that, you say, therefore, life can expand without bound, which is a, a remarkable statement, and it contradicts virtually everyone else that I know. So how, how did I do with the overview? And give me your sense. Well, I would, I would say it's, that's a fairly good overview. I would just put in a, a caveat at the end about life going on forever. The, the important word is, is, is can, or perhaps one even should say could. Um, because uh, that's really, in, in speaking in normal terms, that's the very distant future and really all sorts of things could happen before we get there, speaking in conventional terms. Sure, but uh, you know, we can have a big rip or all sorts of things that people talk about uh, under, understood, but the fundamental point is that the universe is not heading inexorably without any possibility of of change towards this um, elimination of heat or what's called heat death, where everything is totally homogeneous. And, and once that happens, nothing interesting can happen anymore. That, that's quite correct. My, my belief is that var there's no need for variety to stop increasing. Variety can go on increasing forever. That is, that is entirely possible. So that, that's a super important point and it flies in the face of pretty much all of, of our mutual colleagues and their views, which I, which I know you take as a compliment, not a criticism. Uh, so. Well, it's not, it's not quite against everyone. People, the, the, a key thing in this is, is the question of ratios. Uh, uh, quite a lot of modern cosmologists do say that there won't be heat death, but what they say is that the, the density of energy will decrease, but 
all of all that we ever are aware of really is is contrast is densities different brightnesses i mean as i look at your face uh, one side of it is brighter than the other and i notice the difference there so if there is always variety in that sense that in some places intensities are greater than other even if the overall intensity is going down there is still some reality there there is variety this is the key thing if there were no variety we would we would not be able to think about anything we could not have any sense uh, of science so it's variety that's the crucial thing and that depends upon ratios not upon absolute values okay that makes sense but if if the if the trend is towards uh, this uh, homogeneity then take you know at the asymptote take it out as long as long as you can eventually it will depress the capacity on a, on a continuing basis to create variety and eventually become zero by no means necessarily i mean the you can go on creating uh, differences all the way just think about ordinary real numbers with their decimal expansion the decimal expansion can go on forever so there's always going to be a difference between one decimal place and the next one so to speak so well, you, you you could have two you could imagine two real numbers looking at their decimal expansion as you go along there's always a difference between them so well, so there's there's absolutely no reason for variety to be killed off just because uh, one's got an idea of an intensity. I think a lot of the problem comes from not thinking about the entire universe. All around us, we see measuring rods and clocks, and we think they are absolute, but there can't be a measuring rod outside the universe. We have to look for measuring rods within the universe. And if the things we take to be measuring rods there are some that are so long, as long as that, and there are other ones that are that long, there'll be a difference between them. Even if you might imagine that they're all getting smaller, but that difference remains. It's that ratio that is always the one that counts. Two is always less than three. Your analogy to the real numbers and how they work uh, is, it supports your point. But I wonder, is there a fundamental difference between the abstract quality of numbers and the reality factors of matter? For example, you know, we talk about uh, the uh, uh, Planck lengths. And so as things get smaller and smaller, if they hit a hurdle, call it a Planck length or whatever, uh, that, that changes the physical dynamics. And so the, the, the analogy to the abstract, abstract numbers to physical matter is not direct. It's not direct, but we don't really know what happens at the Planck length. At the moment, the Planck length is ultimately determined really by the frequencies of the cesium atom, because that's the key thing in metrology. Yeah. And we don't really know what happens to, I mean, certainly cesium atoms don't exist down at the Planck length, that's for sure. Uh, so it's, it's, it's uncertain. I mean, the, the fact is, all scientific data ultimately come in the form of numbers. And if there are differences between numbers, if there are ratios, uh, then there's, there's meaning. There is always meaning in ratios. Okay, so let's do this. Let's go through each of the points that, that uh, I, I've put together as sort of the big categories that, that you have and, and, and give me a sense of why these things are true. I think everything I said uh, uh, is is uh, <laughs> contradicts the conventional wisdom. Um, there are people I'm sure who agree with you, but so each of these points, let's start with, with your uh, concept of time that it doesn't flow, it does not have a single direction past the future. This is something you've worked on for, for decades and, and, and are in fact a, a, a world standard on this, but let me hear it afresh. So the, the first point about time not, uh, not necessarily flowing in only just one direction. Uh, first of all, all the known laws of nature, at least all the ones that could possibly count in determining what is called the arrow of time, they, are, uh, they don't make a distinction between the direction of, of time. The laws work the same way in both directions. And this has been the great mystery really since the discovery of the laws of thermodynamics around 1850. So, uh, but what people always thought about, I think the key thing in all of this that has 
why people have not realized the proper way to think about this is that the laws of thermodynamics were discovered through the behavior of steam engines. And the, what a steam engine must maintain, keep the steam in the cylinder box, in the cylinder. And so I say that all of the conceptualization of all of these issues has been for steam in a box or a system in a box. And a system in a box behaves completely differently from one that is not. You can, I mean, people say you start off with, with uh, shall we say, a drop of liquid in the corner of a box. That is a very low entropy state. The, if it's in the box, the liquid will, will it, it might even be a little bit of ice initially, the ice will become water, the water will evaporate, and the water molecules will spread out over the whole box. That's the classic story of the increase of entropy. Mm -hmm. However, if there is no box there, and that ice is out in space, and it melts, it will behave in a completely different way. It will go, it will expand out. In fact, actually what it typically does is expand like an expanding universe. But if at the same time, these atoms can interact gravitationally, they would cluster together and form structure. And this behavior in, in Newton's theory of gravity was already clearly recognized in 1772. And when that happens, if you just look at Newton's theory, as long as the energy is not negative, so zero energy or positive energy, you find that the system grows in size in both directions of time. There's always a minimum size where the system is most uniform, the distribution of the particles is most uniform, and in both directions the structure grows. So this aspect of Newton's theory, nobody has recognized it, although it was discovered in one of the most important papers by the mathematician Lagrange in 1772. And it was that insight, actually, as recently as 2012, which made me realize this could be the explanation of the arrow of time. The, the, the approach that you're, you're using on this um, is the fundamental difference between a confined space and a space that has no, has no bounds. Um, it, it's not clear to me why to, the, um, to that individual space where that uh, uh, kernel of ice is, 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 is uh, evaporating, why that's different than the closed box. At some point it will, but initially it would be the same. It depends how big your box, your, your conceptual box is. Well, yes, actually, in the initial stage of the ice melting and the water then evaporating, it is actually rather like that happening in, in empty space. Uh, and it would look initially like an expanding universe, but it's the, it's the box that is so important. That is where the, the idea that entropy is bound to increase eventually comes. Right. Oh, oh, that, okay. that doesn't change at all. So you, you have uh, introduced a, a new concept called entex, entexy, if I pronounce it properly. Ent I never, entaxy, yeah. Entaxy, okay, get my, get my uh, emphasis in the right place. Um, and you define this kind of the opposite of entropy because it's something that um, it, 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 it kind of helps create structure or it, it decreases. It, it, it's sort of everything you thought about entropy and turning it upside down. That's, that's quite correct. And, and I think it's, uh, the people have said for a long time that gravity is anti-thermodynamic because if you start off with a, a uniform distribution of matter subject to Newton's gravity, the system will, will clump, will, will, this, is, this is the phenomenon I'm talking about. And right, so right. to save the second law of thermodynamics, everybody is so determined they must save the second law of the dynamics, it cannot be violated. They say gravity is anti-thermodynamic and it increases when it, the entropy of, uh, under gravity increases. But I'm saying actually stop and think actually what it's doing, it's becoming more special. I mean, uh, I mean, if you look around the universe, it looks very special. It doesn't look disordered at all. I mean, the mere fact that we can talk to each other, we can right. go out with telescopes and look at these fabulous galaxies and things. Does that look like disorder? Tell it to the Marines is all I can say. Look, I loved your analogy because the typical 
um, a way to describe and lay terms the expanding universe is a balloon that's that's expanding and so dots on the balloon get further and further apart as the expansion occurs but but you characterize it as as coins which are solid and immovable that are kind of pasted on the balloon so within the coin th there is there is structure and that that th th there's no disorder there even though those coins may be getting further and further apart that's quite true the the, the thing that the, it, it all comes back to ratios. The ratio, if you take the diameter of the coin and divide it by the distance to the next coin, that yeah. decreases as the universe, uh, ex, uh, in the normal terms, as the universe expands. That's when people say the universe is expanding. I was on a radio program with the Astronomer Royal in this country, and, and I said, <laughs> Frankly, the expanding universe stinks. It's not <laughs> expanding, it's changing its shape. Oh. It is what it's doing. That is the only objective truth. It is changing its shape. This is so, all that the astronomers observe. So that's your second big point, that the, the history of the universe is a succession of, sh a succession of shapes. And these shapes, the relationship the, between them is what gives us duration and then our sense of time? Correct, and it's uh, and there's also no shadow of doubt that these shapes are getting more structured and more interesting. I mean, there's no shadow of doubt that when you go back near to the Big Bang, the universe looked very uniform, and it's been getting less and less uniform and more and more structured, at least up to now. What might happen in the very distant future, we cannot say with any degree of confidence, but we okay, know that happened up to now. Let me give you the traditional argument that um, that you need to uh, uh, undermine uh, is, that explains that. And that says that while the overall universe is indeed increasing in entropy, so that the second law is maintained, um, locally, that because of the flow of energy, like from the sun to the earth, there can be structure, plants, people or whatever, but that's drawing the sun's energy. So it's a, it's a, it's a local concentration that uh, increases order and structure, which seemingly uh, contradicts the second law, but no, it doesn't really, because the energy that it's drawing from outside um, m more than makes up for that. That's the conventional way of looking at it, but there is another way uh, I, a, a thing that I think is very important is what William Thompson, who then became Lord Kelvin, said in 1852. He had a very significant paper which he titled On a Universal Tendency in Nature to the Dissipation of Mechanical Energy. And mm. this, this is the sort of story. Now, he said he had chosen the word dissipation because he did not mean that energy was being destroyed. Only uh, the creator could do that. What, what he could have said was that energy is spreading. Now, if energy is spreading, that doesn't mean to say that structure is being destroyed. The image I give right at the end of my book is if I have a bit of a blob of ink on a piece of white paper and I put my thumb down on that ink, I just get a smudge. But if instead I take a pen, a pen I can take exactly the same amount of ink and draw a beautiful diagram if I'm a good artist. And my, my contention is that is what nature is doing. It is spreading out energy and creating structure. And you can see a beautiful example of this. It's been raining a lot in this, uh, around here in the last few days. I walked down to a stream where the water flows over, a, a shallow water flows over a, 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 a ford and water drops fall from the tree into the water. So there's energy concentrated in that drop of water as it falls into the water. But when it does that, beautiful circular wings, rings spread out. So that is your spreading of the energy, which was all concentrated in the thing. Right. And it's created that beautiful picture. And you have lots of drops coming down and all those circular waves pass through each other. They don't destroy each other, they pass through each other. So actually, you can sit there and watch it for hours, and it's a very beautiful effect. That is energy spreading. That, I think, is the right way one should talk about the second law of thermodynamics when you haven't got a system imprisoned in a box. That drop of water is not imprisoned. It, it is eventually because there's the banks of the stream. But if this was 
a still ocean, those waves could go on forever. Well, they could go on forever, um, but th there's some attenuation of uh, over t over time. There's attenuation, but not of necessarily of the ratios, because bigger ones will meet smaller ones, and when the bigger ones meet smaller ones, there's always a difference. You what you need is difference to talk about science. So your characterization, which is what I had your point three. Uh, that the history of the universe is not one of increasing disorder, but rather of the growth of structure, whereas the conventional wisdom says that, yes, there is the growth of structure. That's obvious. You can't deny that. Uh, but it is, it, it is because of the differential in the universe in different segments of it, but still there's an overall disorder. So that, that, that is a cruxial point because everything that you uh, project, speculation, of course, everything you project is dependent upon that fundamental point. Is that right? Can you just, I, 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 could you repeat the point you sure. say? The, the... Sure. I may not, I may not repeat it the same way the second time. No, 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 that doesn't matter. <laughs> uh, the, the fundamental aspects of your big speculation, your big idea, is based on the fact that the increasing growth of structure is a fundamental part of the, what I think you call the law of the universe. So Absolutely, it's a, yes. Big idea, this big idea. Um, that this that, That's the important thing. Whereas conventional wisdom says, yes, we see the growth of structure. Of course we do. But that is because we are in, 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 um, in local areas drawing on the, uh, the energy of, of, of the totality. And therefore in other areas, the entropy is, is still increasing. So the overall uh, a sum is is still towards disorder over over time, but locally there is this growth of structure because of this differential. So what I'm saying is, and you you've explained that, but that is the fundamental uh, idea that undergirds your your totality. Yes, I mean, can I just say something a little bit about black holes? Because black, I mean, this was the famous discovery of Stephen Hawking that when black holes form, a huge amount of of matter is concentrated in a very small region, but that is actually changing the structure of the universe. It's putting a lot of matter in a very small space. Um, we know we've seen this marvelously when two black holes merge. It's just like that drop of water falling yeah. in, into yeah. the into the water. That, the gravitational waves spread out. It's just yeah. unbelievable it the is. information that is constantly yeah. streaming over the Earth with with the details of what is going on right back to very close to the Big Bang. Right, they're milliseconds, they're very we thing. But... Up here. And, and uh, the lower we, the, 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 the more we go down in the energy that we receive, uh, the, all, we still go on picking up details. I mean, these radio telescopes now are, are picking up energy densities that are unbelievably low but they're still picking up all this fabulous structure and a and, uh, picture of what the universe is like. I mean, it's tremendous. Let's go to, let's go to the Big Bang because you have a, a, a definitely a new vision of it. This is your Janus point in which you say time flows in both directions or two directions from that, driven by the expansion of the universe or the growth of structure. So, so take me through that. So first I should say, there are two possibilities that what happened at the Big Bang or the Janus point. Uh, uh, one is that the, uh, in the talking in the conventional way, the size of the universe does not go to zero. This is the situation that Lagrange discovered in 1772. Then the, you just have uh, a situation where effectively there are two universes with opposite directions of time. There is one point where in the conventional way, the size of the universe is its least at the smallest value, and the distribution of matter is most uniform. And in both directions away from it, the matter clumps, the structure grows. That's the picture if the universe does not go to zero size. Possibly much more exciting is when it does go to zero size, and it may be even there that my Janus point idea may be challenged. This would depend on exactly how quantum gravity comes out in the end. It may be that there is actually just one point 
one's very special shape of the universe and and out of it all possible shapes emerge bit by bit as it were from a single point a single shape which i call alpha now that's an idea which actually developed as i was writing the book and might even undermine the title of the book but uh, either way the problem of the or i think either way whichever possibility turns out to be the better one the, there is a an explanation of the arrow of time that mystery of why everything flows in in the same direction if the size is non zero then there is these arrows pointing in its op opposite directions and the symmetry is respected all the solutions have the same symmetry if the size goes to zero and this more uh, radical idea is correct then the universe will have a unique <clears throat> beginning the law of the universe says it must start in the most uniform state that is absolutely possible and from then on uh, variety will go on increasing forever each successive shape will have a greater variety uh, so I, I can appreciate um, the concept and I see obviously our side of the Big Bang where time flows in the direction we're familiar with I, flows as I'll put in quotes um, but what happens on the other side the other side you say structure uh, also is developed as time goes in the opposite direction how, how does that well, work? It, 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 uh, first of all, anybody like you and me who, who, who can talk to each other, they're going to be on one side or other of the Janus point. Okay, right. And for them, for each side, time will seem to flow forward in exactly the same way. I mean, one just analogy, I mean, imagine that you and I went to the top of Mount Fuji in Japan, and we walked in opposite directions down that beautiful mountain. As we go down, we find the landscape and the vegetation changing progressively as it goes down. And essentially it will change in exactly the same way for each of us. So as we go down in our separate ways, we can't talk to each other. We can't shout over the top of Mount Fuji. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we just find that the, the, the world changes in exactly the same way for us. So Look, if by any chance we could then speak on the phone, we would say we've had exactly the same, or, qualitatively the same experience you know I, I love the the analogies that you use here and, and and in your book I mean they're very rich and they're very meaningful and and, and of course they do support your vision <laughs> um, but I, I I always have to wonder that there seems to be a, a vast gulf between these human related um, macroscopic uh, analogies and and what we're talking about in terms of of the universe it, 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 there's so many bizarre things from quantum mechanics to uh, size and, and and everything else but but the analogies are great and uh you know so i'm i i like them a lot yeah well i what i will say is i think they are it's it, it amazes me i think they are actually almost the first time anybody has spoken like this I, it, it, it it to me it is an amazing fact that people have just not questioned that box in which thermodynamics was discovered. So mm -hmm. much came out of thermodynamics, including after 50 years, the discovery of quantum mechanics. They, they, they all, it was critical that box, the, the theory all assumed that the atoms and the molecules bounced elastically off the wall of the box. And mm -hmm. that led, to, they, they confirmed the existence of atoms and molecules, their sizes, and eventually they discovered quantum mechanics. That is absolutely amazing. And people were so amazed by that, and it seemed absolutely inevitable that the second law must be absolutely true. And nobody has questioned that. Mm. I search every time I look at what people have written in books, in scientific papers, I have not seen one single person questioning this assumption that the system is in a box. Mm. Well, this also relates to this uh, enormous contradiction that that you talk about which says that the, the universe had to begin with with very high order very low entropy um, and then has been going through this progressive degradation uh, through the inexorable effect of the, of the second law of thermodynamics and yet all around us there's there's the, the growth of structure and what some people have done Roger Penrose in particular and 
he's a friend of all of ours and we wish him uh, great congratulations for his long uh, uh, awaited Nobel. So that's great. Um, but he talks about, and he, he, he even comes up a number, the, the, the level of, 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 of order in, in, in that he has to have in the early universe is like 10 to the, um, to the 120, first power, which is 121 zeros, the number doesn't have a name, um, it's so large. Uh, but, but so he has to come up with that in order to play out the traditional structure. And you don't need to do that. Is that right? Well, I, my position that I've put in the book very hesitantly, uh, well, I hope respectfully, because it's two very great scientists, is that both Richard Feynman and Roger Penrose may have got to the right answer, but with the wrong argument. Yeah. You, you, take think, on the big, you take on the biggest and the best. <laughs> yes, well, no, I, I, I mean, I think it's, it's, the, it's absolutely, there's this famous theorem that Poincaré proved in, in, in the early 1890s called the recurrence theorem, that basically if you have a system which has got to be in a box, then it will always come back to the state that it was in once before arbitrarily closely. Mm -hmm. And if you look carefully at the arguments that both Feynman and Penrose do, underlying that is the assumption that the universe is in a box. It's, it's, it's quite clear in, in, in Feynman, and it's also, if you look carefully in Penrose, <clears throat> when he comes up with that um, estimate, that fabulous number, Basically, he's assuming, uh, it's a critical point in his, his first book, The Emperor's New Mind, that the universe recollapses, it doesn't expand forever, and that's what has enables him to come up with an estimate. He assumes that all the <clears throat> matter in the observable universe collapses into a black hole. He estimates the entropy of that black hole using Hawking's formula, and that's what leads him to this absolutely colossal number. But pretty well all the evidence at the moment, most cosmologists now are convinced, the, uh, think the strong evidence the universe will go on expanding forever. So I think that strongly undermines Penrose's argument. Nevertheless, uh, that the universe would start off with a very uniform special state, that was always very likely going right back to this paper of Lagrange in 1772, that, that it would be uh, there the would be a uniform, a most uniform state in the past. So I think that the, the, the conclusion is correct, but the argument is wrong. <laughs> Julia, I've I got to answer back, but, but Roger might get, a, he's only 25 miles away, he might get a bit annoyed with me. Julian, this has been absolutely fascinating. It's remarkable how you have developed these ideas since last we talked. Uh, I'd really be interested, as your book is published, The Janus Point, A New Theory of Time, we, we want to support it. Um, and as you get feedback from it and you get reaction from the physics, physics and cosmology communities, come back and talk to us. Tell us what they say and uh, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll see your responses. So congratulations on the book. Look forward to next time. Thank you for watching. If you like this video, please like and comment below. You can support Closer to Truth by subscribing.